May we put together previous scripture, 65 books before this one, Lord, that have so many scriptures that inform us of what we're studying uh, in our passage. So may we look with great anticipation to the future where Jesus will end every rebellion and bring in his righteous kingdom. And Lord, we're not there yet. As your word says in Acts 14, through many trials and tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. So help us to consider all trials joy uh, as we understand that they are meant for our growth and our growth to spiritual maturity. We'll ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the bigger section of chapter 13 has chapter 12 before, uh, before it and then chapter 14 after, which in this unit, this pause, if you will, in chapter 12, you had Israel, the woman, that's who the woman is in that chapter. She flees from Satan, the dragon, and we have God's preservation of the nation Israel. Now we're in chapter 13, which focuses on the Antichrist and the false prophet, the two primary people Satan will use to dominate the world and attempt to destroy Israel. And then Revelation 14 is followed by six scenes of hope, which will be encouraging as we will eventually get to that chapter. So chapter 13 deals with a scene on earth. If you read Revelation, it'll take you to heaven and then take you down to earth. So Revelation 13 deals with a scene on earth. You have the rise of the beast out of the sea and the work of the beast and the false prophet on earth who are empowered by Satan, the dragon, during that future seven-year tribulation. I do not personally believe that we are in the tribulation. Are we in tribulation? Yes. Uh, Acts 14.21, we're in a time of trials and tribulations. But the tribulation, Daniel's 70th week, is still future. So we have the two beasts of Revelation 13. The first beast is the first 10 verses, the Antichrist. And then you have a second beast, 13, 11 through 18, um, the false prophet. He's actually called a beast in this chapter, but he is the false prophet. Um, and you know it's another beast because Revelation 13, 11, do you see the words, and I saw another beast, Alo Therion, another beast. So it's a different person than the Antichrist. It's the false prophet. Uh, no doubt the Antichrist is even mentioned in that final section, but there's the false prophet that is revealed here. So we've covered the first two verses a few weeks ago. So let's read those. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. All those are descriptions found in Daniel 7. With the four beasts that Daniel mentions, minus the beast with iron teeth, the fourth beast. But he mentions three in reverse order. Probably because he's looking back into history, or Daniel was looking prophetically. But I do think when you see the destruction of these nations uh, in Daniel, they're put in reverse order. When Jesus returns, they all get destroyed in the reverse order. So we have the leopard, the bear, and the lion. You'll see all this in Daniel 7. And then the middle of verse 2, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. So we've covered those two verses, and now we get to verse 3. And I saw one of his heads. How many heads were there? Seven. Sometimes you have to read this over and over to keep up. But I saw on one of his heads that as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. 
Now, in verse 1, John saw one of the seven heads of the beast as if it had been slain. Do you have that, that language? As if it had been slain. And then his fatal wound was healed. So the phrase, as if slain, in this verse literally says, slain resulting in death or slain to death. The word death is actually there, asthanaton in the Greek language. Now, this phrase can refer to literal death. It's used of Jesus Christ who actually died, died on the cross. And then after he was put on, in the tomb, he was raised to life. Remember Revelation 5, 6, John says, I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain. There's that same language. It doesn't say slain to death, but it has the same word uh, to slay. So if Jesus was slain, that's a reference to what? The cross. But if he's standing after the cross, what does that mean? Resurrection. That would have been good for last week. So it is used of Jesus who died and rose again as if slain. So it can refer to a literal death. But back to 13.3, the beast has seven heads. Right? Earlier it said seven heads. Now, what are these seven heads? Because one of them is wounded unto death and comes back. So, some believe this is simply the Antichrist, which I think will be a reference to him later in the chapter. Now, there's another way to handle this, and I want to present this to you today, as I think I've already alluded to you. So the beast has seven heads. The heads refer to seven anti-Semitic nations of the past, meaning they went against Israel, that have persecuted Israel in the past. So what are those seven nations? Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, then Rome. Uh, how many is that? At six, where's the seventh? Rome too, a revived Roman Empire. So if his head was, receives this mortal wound and comes back, what does it tell you about the empire? It's come, it comes back. So I think the head that receives the fatal wound that's healed refers to the revived Roman Empire over which Antichrist rules. Now, a major debate, I could have said it before I even said what I just said. Does that make sense? What I just said, does that make sense? But a debate centers on whether this is a national or individual resurrection. Some refer resuscitation, a, a, a resuscitation back to life, a revival back to life. But a good case is made for both. If you look at the chapter as a whole, in verse 3, one of the seven heads of the beast was slain and healed which I think is national. But in verse 14, I think it refers to the individual Antichrist. Um, 13, 14 is on the slide below. Later in this same chapter, and he, who's he? The false prophet in context, deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, the Antichrist telling those who dwell on the earth to... So the false prophet tells the earth dwellers, these unbelievers, to make an image to the beast. Now, who's the beast? The Antichrist, who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. So now the Antichrist comes back to life after a, a wound. So I think both are represented here, and some scholars hold to a national and individual resurrection or resuscitation. Uh, Dr. Walverd, in his commentary, he entertained both of them as plausible, and he made a case for this 13.3 being a national idea. Uh, Dr. Andy Woods takes this chapter to refer to both a national and individual resurrection. So let's look at the national idea here. Hold on a second. Um, 
before I do this. Okay. Go to um, Revelation 17, which is on the slide here. So if you take this national idea, you can go to Revelation 17 for development. So the beast has ten horns and seven heads. Sometimes we get that backwards. Ten heads, seven horns. No. Ten horns, the ten-nation confederacy in the future, and seven heads. I think the seven heads being seven kings... Or seven anti-Semitic kingdoms that have come against Israel. So look at 17, 9, and 10. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are what? Seven mountains on which the woman sits. Who's the woman? Who? Israel in chapter 12. Who's the woman here? Babylon. Babylon. Because if you look at 17.5, it says the woman is Babylon the Great. It's not the Catholic Church. Babylon is what? Babylon. Babylon. <laughs> and this city will be rebuilt and be a major power center in the tribulation. But you know, you know in Revelation 16, in one of the bold judgments, Babylon's destroyed... Revelation 17 and 18 give a detailed description of her fall. So you have this pause after the the bold judgments and says, let me give you some detail about Babylon, the harlot. So the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. So that's Babylon, the woman. And verse 10, and they are seven kings. Five have fallen. Okay, so what I'm saying is the five that have fallen are Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, and Greece. All those in order, right? But then keep going. One is. So what one am I missing? Rome. So there's the sixth. The other has not yet come. I think that's the revived Roman Empire. So you have Rome one. The, the sixth one mentioned, and then the other who has not yet come, the seventh is Rome II, or often referred to as the revived Roman Empire. And when he comes, the revived Roman Empire, he must remain a little while. Ah, notice it doesn't say forever. So what happens to that empire? It falls. Because Christ's kingdom, according to the Prophecy in Daniel will replace all the kingdoms of man with his kingdom. Notice he doesn't blend them all together. Eh, let's all just worship different gods and come together. No, the millennium is his reign in Revelation 20. So I think when the world sees the Roman Empire that once dominated the world come back to life politically, the fatal wound that was healed on one of his heads on one of the heads of the beast, the world's going to be amazed. So then you get the individual resurrection with 13, 14. We already looked at it, but, and he, the false prophet, deceives the whole world or those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast, that's the Antichrist, who had the wound of the sword and who has come to life. Hey, didn't God bring the two witnesses back to life after they were dead in the presence of all the people and he brought them to heaven? You don't see that every day, do you? Well, Satan's always into the counterfeit to draw people to himself. So verse 14 deals with the Antichrist himself. And then if you look at verse 18, he's even referred to as a man. So Satan works a miraculous resurrection from the dead with the Antichrist, some say, or just a resuscitation, in parallel with the resurrection or resuscitation of the revived Roman Empire, 
And the world will follow this one world ruler, the Antichrist. So the individual Antichrist's fatal wound being healed indicates that he actually dies physically and then comes back to life to the amazement of the people. So this counterfeit miracle with, was empowered by who? Satan, the dragon, which is in keeping with Bible prophecy that speaks of Satan empowering the Antichrist. Remember 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 through 10. Paul told the church, then that lawless one will be revealed. Who is that? That's the Antichrist in the future tribulation, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth. In other words, it was really easy. How easy was it? By his word. Some would argue you're breathing right now and probably don't even realize it. You're not, are you thinking about every breath you take? No, but it's so simple that that's how easy this will be. But it could just be his word because when the sword comes out of Jesus' mouth when he's on the white horse in Revelation 19, he strikes the enemy just with his speech. So the Lord will slay him with the breath of his mouth and bring an end bring to an end by the appearance of His coming, a second advent of Jesus. That is, so who is this lawless one? The one who comes, the one who's coming, excuse me, is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all powers and signs and false wonders. So in our day, if anyone says this was a miracle and they just attach the name Jesus, everybody says it's of Jesus. Is that always true? Who else can do false, or who else can do wonders, but they're false? Satan. So that, we need to at least put that in the equation and not just take everything at face value because somebody said in Jesus' name. I'm going to show you in a, in this chapter, I forget exactly where I put it. It's down when we get to the false prophet. But you know that passage in Matthew 7? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. You ever heard that? Does that mean you, Christians? People say, yeah. Not uh, See, didn't we cast out demons in your name and prophesy in your name? See, they say they have to be Christians. But if you read the context, go back up in that chapter. It says, beware of what? Ah, false prophets. We don't read that part. So what do false prophets do? Speak false words. Deuteronomy 13, he says, watch them. They may do miracles, but whatever they say is how you recognize them. Ha, ah, by their fruits you will know them. Not by what they do, what they say. Because prophets can do good things, right? But sometimes they'll counsel rebellion. And God says in Deuteronomy 13, under the law, that prophet shall die. So Deuteronomy 18, Jesus is the true prophet. So how do you know he's the true prophet? Primarily. Not what he does, what he says. And then when he says truth, he'll validate it with a true miracle. But then where we miss a huge place, Jeremiah 14. That chapter said, God says, there are prophets prophesying in my name, but I don't know them. I didn't send them. So what is Jesus saying? The same thing. I'm the true prophet, Deuteronomy 18. The Pharisees are the false prophets. God doesn't even know them. So quit using that as a Christian who says, I did this in your name. It's not a Christian. You cannot lose your salvation. That passage is not teaching that. It's saying there are false prophets that God doesn't even know, but they use his name all the time. We did this in your name. We prophesied in your name, and God says, I don't know you. So Jesus is really coming out of Deuteronomy 13, Deuteronomy 18, Uh, Jeremiah 14 with that text. Read the whole context. I've had more people throw that at me that say, well, if you get to the end of your life and even though you did good things for Jesus, you still might lose your salvation. Talk about misusing the Bible. In my older years here, not that I'm an ancient man, but I'm almost 58, I'm getting really tired of people misusing the Bible. Not that I'm perfect in my translation or interpretation, but we, sometimes we just wield it like a child that's found his dad's, dad's gun. We don't care. We just make it mean whatever we want. The context means nothing. And it really messes up 
um, interpretation and terrible application. You know, I just gave my sermon that's three weeks down the road on the false prophet. Now, I want to validate that because you will be hit with that one. Going into the jails all those years, they came to me with that one all the time. That, see, you can lose your salvation. And they quoted one verse. I said, well, go back to, I think it's 7, is it 13 or 14? Beware of false prophets. Oh, are they saved? No, they're not children of God. So that's who he's talking about. Where was I? Oh, back to the second test. So the Antichrist will be empowered by Satan, and there will be counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. Verse 9. Now, verse 10, with all deception of wickedness for those who perish because they didn't receive the love of the truth and so be saved. This will be at a global scale in the tribulation. How many will follow the Antichrist and this false prophet is going to be doing these miracles to bring glory to this evil world ruler empowered by Satan. And that's exactly what Satan wants because he wants all the glory through his representatives. But... Isn't that God's prerogative? I am the Lord, that is my name, and I will not share my glory with another, nor give my praises to graven images, Isaiah 42, 8. And doesn't he have prophets that come in his name that do miracles to bring glory to him? You see this total uh, battle between Satan, the unholy trinity, Satan, the beast, and the false prophet, versus the holy trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So verse 4, they worship the dragon because he gave authority to the beast. And they worship the beast, so they worship Satan and the beast. And listen to what they say. Who is like the beast? Is this like a praise? Who is like the beast? Who is able to wage war with him? So they're venerating the beast. But before we get to that in a little more detail... The dragon is the same dragon from verse 1, right? Revelation 13, 1, and the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. He was clearly defined as Satan back in chapter 12. Just go back that one chapter, go to 12, 9. I heard somebody say recently, Revelation will often interpret itself. Just keep going a little further or go back and you'll see But 12.9, and the great dragon was thrown down. Who is he? Well, the serpent of old. That would be Satan, right, from the garden? The serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field. Um, Genesis 3.1. The serpent of old, who is called the devil, and Satan. So he's a deceiver, diabolos. He's satanas from the Hebrew Satan, which means adversary. You got some great... Don't ever name your child dragon, serpent, devil, or Satan, okay? Because Satan is a name, but it's also a verb to be an adversary. So Satan got a name that means adversary. Oh, his name before his fall is Halel ben Shachar from uh, Isaiah 14, which means the shining one or the bright morning star, son of the dawn. A beautiful name, but his name changed when he went against the Lord. And now his name is deceiver or adversary or one who withstands or opposes. And notice it says he deceives the whole world and he was thrown down to the earth. And that's what we're dealing with in chapter 13 because Satan will be cast to the earth And those last three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation will be the worst this earth has ever seen. And another problem, his angels were thrown down with him. If it wasn't bad enough that Satan has come down to the earth, now the angels are with him. The fallen angels that followed him and his rebellion at his fall. So the first part of verse 4 says they actually worship Satan. Um... And I think Satan worship has existed since the fall of man. And it even exists today, obviously. There are actually religious organizations that claim Satan 
individually, Satan as their God. And you can hear testimonies of some of these people, and I have met some of them. In the prison, I met some that say, we were worshiping Satan as if you were worshiping Jesus. And we, it isn't that we did, were indirectly doing it and didn't know it. No, we went to him like, you guys go to Christ, and, and these guys were now saved saying this. So if anyone knew what that was all about, it was some of these guys. So there's religious groups that actually claim Satan as their God. Many worship Satan direct, <coughs> excuse me, directly or indirectly through tarot cards, psychic activity, the paranormal. Don't think you're just dabbling in that. It's dangerous to get near it. But in the tribulation, in that seven-year period in the future, the worship of Satan will be on a global scale that has never occurred in history. So verse 4 says they worshiped Satan the dragon. Then verse 4 also says they worshiped who? The beast, his primary representative, the Antichrist. So it seems at this point, now here's where it gets tricky on the national versus individual view. When does it go away from the national beast to the individual? Some would say verse 4. The national beast being the first three verses. And I understand the difficulty with that. And some would say, well, it's just easier to say the entire chapter is the singular antichrist. But that's a little difficult, I think, with verse 1 and 2. So these earth dwellers, these witnesses who worship the beast, what do they say? Who is like the beast? I don't think they're saying this in fear. I think they're saying it as if to glorify him. Wow, look at him. Who is like the beast? So they're giving praise and glorification for his power. Now, as I looked at this a few weeks ago, I thought, okay, they're saying this about the Antichrist who Satan, I think, will indwell. But what do, they, what do godly people say about God? Who is like God? Look at the, the absolute counterpart to this. Let me give you a few of these. In contrast, believers in the Old Testament, in praise and worship of Yahweh, would say, who is like God? Remember after they went through the Red Sea, there's the song of Moses in Exodus 15, a praise of God's power who delivered them from Egypt. Now, by the way, who rules Egypt? Satan is the ruler of the nations, right? And he rules the evil nations to, who he encourages to persecute Israel. So God protected his seed, Israel, in uh, Egypt for 400 years. Think God knew what he was doing? God, God, you forgot your people. You left them in slavery. Well, what can that do? I think by the end of Genesis, it, they were getting so ungodly and making such stupid decisions among the Jewish people that I think God put them in Egypt to protect them for 400 years. And what else can happen in 400 years? Because the Egyptians would not interbreed with them. Oh, that's not good. No, that's great because now the Jews can stay a Jewish people. And so in 400 years, can you get a bunch of Jews? Yeah, they let them have children. Hey, more slaves, right? God's like, well, good, I'll have more to bring out. And so we, after 400 plus years, he brings them out. He knew what he was doing. And then what does he do? He crushes the nation that tries to persecute his seed. Because Israel is carrying what seed? Singular. The Christ is in the nation. So God is protecting the national seed because out of that national seed through the tribe of Judah, one tribe will come Jesus. And Satan just can't stop it. So they get at, uh, past the Red Sea after God's deliverance and drowning the Egyptians. And Moses pens this mighty song of praise to God for his power. And they say in 1511, who is like you? Just like they're saying, who is like the beast? Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Remember the false gods of Egypt? They're not even true gods. They're just demons behind them. Deuteronomy 32, 17 tells us that. 
So he defeated the false gods of Egypt because that's what he said at Passover. Because I will go through on this night and execute judgment on all the gods of Egypt. Exodus 12, 13. So the Passover and all these plagues, the ten plagues going to that final plague of the death of the firstborn, was really an attack on Israel, or I'm sorry, Egypt's false gods. So who's, which god is greater, our god or the gods of the Egyptians? And Satan's the god of this world, defeated every time. So who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? So what's the answer to that, congregation? No one. Amen? We should all at one time go, no one but God. <laughs> Psalm 3510. Two, two Psalms. 3510, all my bones will say, Lord, who is like you? So this is a worshiper. Who delivers the afflicted from him who is too strong for him, and the afflicted and the needy from him who robs him? So the psalmist says, no one's like you. You're a deliverer of the afflicted. Be careful. If you have a King James, they put the poor. The King James seems to think the poor only means people without money. Uh, there's one place again, which I keep showing you, the afflicted are those who are afflicted by what they're seeing uh, in their life, they're believers who are afflicted by the covenant violation of Israel. They're afflicted by the nations who don't follow God. And so what does Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the poor, no, poor in spirit, but actually the word is afflicted because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Have you ever heard the people that say, see, if you have money, you go to hell? If you're poor, you go to heaven. Well... Luke 6 says poor, Matthew 5 says poor in spirit. Ah, it's spiritual, right? And the word afflicted in Hebrew sometimes can mean poor, but often afflicted. So Jesus is saying to those who are afflicted, like the psalmist in Psalm 35, I'm here to remove the affliction off the nation. It's not about money or no money. So God will help the needy and the afflicted, and who is like him? I get family of God, remember, you can go to your brother for help, for prayer, and sometimes we need to help one another. But if you go to a person ultimately ahead of God, you're out of line. Who should you always ultimately go to? The Lord. And he may be saying, okay, church, help the person. He came to me. We need to help. I get that. But some people say, well, God isn't there for me, so I'm going. Where are you going then? To someone of the world? You don't think he, he, uh, he doesn't care for you? Because sometimes if God doesn't answer us in five seconds, we think he doesn't care. Sometimes his, his answer is 10 years later in a prayer. If you're saying, oh, I hurt physically, I, be, I want that removed, and he won't remove it, when will he? The resurrection, right? He's, it's not that he doesn't care. Um, as I keep saying, there's no problem in your life that the resurrection won't fix. Somebody at the end of the service come up to me and tell me what problem will not be fixed at the resurrection for you. Or some would say the rapture for us, right? So we, we don't, he will fix it. If it's not in your timing, just be patient with him. And I'm impatient sometimes. I want it now, right? But be careful how you approach God with that. Um, sometimes we need to repent of our impatience. And isn't a, a patience a fruit of the... It's not a fruit of the flesh, is it? It's a fruit of the Spirit. So all my bones will say, Lord, who is like you? So his whole being, who delivers the afflicted from harm. And then Psalm 113, verse 5, who is like our, the Lord our God, who is enthroned on high? Again, the answer to every one of these, no one is an, a direct equivalent. Isaiah um, has a few. Isaiah 40, verse 18, to whom then will you liken God? The answer is no one. Or what likeness will you compare with him? Nothing. Incomparable. Isaiah 40, 25, to whom then will you liken me, God says, that I would be his equal, says the Holy One. And Isaiah 46, 5, to whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that would be alike? God says Obviously, no one. 
And then Jeremiah, a couple from the prophets here, Jeremiah 49, 19, for who is like me, God says, and who will summon me into court? Oh, we're trying to take God to court, aren't we? Who are we to do that? Who is like, him? Who is like the Lord? No one. And who then is the shepherd who can stand against me? Micah 7, 18, who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. Remember when Jesus healed the paralytic and then he says, your sins are forgiven? Remember that? What did the Pharisees say? You can't do that because you're not God, right? Well, what was his point? That he is God, and they would have gone, well, Micah 7, 18, who is like you? To, he, God pardons iniquities. Who are you to say you're forgiven? Because he is God. Jesus was God, and that's what he's trying to prove. His miracles would validate his, his person and his message. So according to Revelation 13... The masses will worship the Antichrist in the future. And 2 Thessalonians 2 predicts that the Antichrist will actually set himself up as God to be worshipped. And, you know, you say we're in stage setting for this. I think the stage has been set, being, being set, since the fall of man. Because Satan knows the, the head crusher is coming, Right? The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. So he's been trying to set the stage for this one world government since the fall of man. And when did he fail the first time? Tower of Babel, Genesis 11. And the nations were scattered, Genesis 10. But he's going to try this again. I think he's been attempting it and been unsuccessful. But God is going to really give him the longest leash and Babylon will be rebuilt And this one world empire will come under the head of Satan and the Antichrist. And just like the Tower of Babel that fell, right? This is going to go down. So 2 Thessalonians 2 predicts the Antichrist will set himself himself up as God to be worshipped. So 2 Thess 2, 3, and 4. And Paul said, let no one in any way deceive you. For it will not come until the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, there's the Antichrist, called the son of destruction. And what, who, what does he do? Who opposes, so this is the Antichrist, he opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God displaying himself as being God. So when they build... Some temple in the, uh, excuse me, in the tribulation, which they will, they'll get to that temple mount somehow and build something in which they can sacrifice. Because remember, he'll, the Antichrist will stop sacrifices and offerings in the middle of the tribulation. And then he will display, the Antichrist will display himself as God in that temple. I think Satan has a God complex. So Satan is worshipped in the future, and his full desire to be like God is fulfilled. Remember Isaiah 14, 14, I will be like the Most High. Satan is the evil power behind the wicked nations. We, we studied that in Ezekiel 28 with the king of Tyre versus the prince of Tyre. I think Satan's the evil power behind the nations. And because men worship Satan, they also worship the beast, That is, the man who rules over the revived Roman Empire. So the overwhelming satanic power, when the church is raptured off this planet before the seven years, I think the Holy Spirit's ministry is removed with us. Could you imagine the evil that is now let out with that being removed? I don't think we understand the church being removed and what kind of vacuum of evil will pour in without the ministry of the Holy Spirit through the church here. But it's going to be something. I mean, we can read about it, but to actually go through it, um, it staggers the imagination. 
So the overwhelming satanic power of the final political empire of the world will lead great masses of mankind to worship the beast. And they'll take the mark. I think they'll want that mark. And um, they'll do it, um, as we'll see later in this chapter, the 666. So they, at the end of verse 4, they ask a question. Who is able to wage war against him? Oh, who is like the beast? Who is able to wage war against him? Test question, who? Christ. Who said Christ? Yes, A plus. And how do we know? We'll look at Revelation 19. Turn there. I like reviewing these verses. Because in Revelation 19, Jesus is returning to establish His kingdom on earth, to replace the kingdoms of man ruled by Satan. Remember that legal transfer in Revelation 11, also 12.10? His kingdom has come. No, it hasn't. It's about to, though. This legal transfer is happening at the midpoint, showing that the Messiah is about to return and establish his. So Revelation 19, 11, John says, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on it is called faithful and true. That's Jesus Christ. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. So they ask, who is able to wage war with the beast? Answer, Christ, and he'll do it. His eyes are a flame of fire, judgment, On his head are many diadems, crowns, authority, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. So quit trying to figure out what that name is because only he knows, right? Well, I wrote a dissertation on what that name means. I'd love to see that. You wrote 300 pages on something that's not revealed. But look how he's clothed with a robe dipped in blood. That's a warrior. His name is called the Word of God. So a robe dipped in blood is picking up the imagery of Isaiah 63, the prophecy that Jesus is the king who comes from Basra covered in blood. And he goes, why is your apparel red? And the Messiah responds, well, I've been treading the winepress of the fierce wrath of God Almighty. So just like somebody in the winepress crushing grapes with their bare feet and having the grape juice splatter all over their robe, red, That's what he's doing with the enemy in this imagery. So he's clothed in a robe, with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth, that's the rider on the white horse, Jesus Christ, comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations. So if it's coming out of his mouth, I think he's just using speech. And he strikes down the nations with his word, since he is the word of God, verse 13. And he will rule them, Messiah will rule a kingdom, with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty, Isaiah 63, 1 through 4. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, the superlative king of kings, so the greatest king. You know, like the holy of holies, the most holy. Well, this superlative, he's the greatest king of all, and he's Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, come assemble for the great supper of God. So now the birds that eat carrion are going to feast on human bodies so that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of commanders, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and all the flesh of men, or the flesh of all men, both free and slaves, small and great. So from all walks of life, the enemies of God, that remember they assemble at Armageddon to challenge the return of Christ 
And that's really Psalm 2. The nations are in an uproar going against God and His anointed. So verse 19, I saw, now watch, who is able to wage war with the beast? If the beast is the Antichrist, look what happens. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. That is Psalm 2, fulfilled. And the beast was seized. So who's that? Antichrist, and with him the false prophet who performed signs in his presence, Revelation 13, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped his image. That's all Revelation 13. These two, the beast and the false prophet, were thrown alive in the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. Who is able to wage war? Keep reading. The Bible, Revelation will interpret itself here. Messiah will do that. So they were thrown into the lake of fire. And then it says, The rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So verse 5, and we're starting to wind this up for today. So there was given to him, I think the Antichrist, a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies. And authority to act for 42 months was given to him. Okay, 42 months, how long? Three and a half years, tribulation, seven years. So it's half of the tribulation, I think the second half. Remember, he's cast down, to, Satan's cast down to the earth. He uses the <clears throat> Antichrist and the false prophet to persecute Israel in the last half mercilessly. And this Antichrist is a, one who blasphemes God for those second, <clears throat> excuse me, second three and a half years. And a major focus in those 42 months will be the destruction of Israel. So look back to 12, chapter 12, 13, and 14. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, I think at the midpoint of the tribulation, he persecuted the woman, that's Israel, defined earlier in the chapter, who gave birth to the male child. So remember, out of the nation Israel came Jesus the Messiah. Really, and actually through one individual woman named Mary. Was Mary Jewish? What tribe? Judah, the right tribe in the line of David. So the dragon uses the beast and the false prophet of Revelation 13 to do all this. But God delivers her, 14. But the two wings of a great eagle were given to the woman, that's Israel, so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished, uh, meant God gave provision, for a time, times, and half a time. A numerical figure that comes out of Daniel. Time is a year. Times would be two years, so that's one plus two is three, and then half a times, half a year, so three and a half years. From the presence of who? Serpent. The serpent, Revelation twelve nine. the serpent of old, that's the dragon, that's Satan, the... Uh, the devil. So this Antichrist speaks out arrogant words against the Lord. And God, who, and who gives him authority to act for these three and a half years? God allows him to do it. Um, sometimes God does that. Because all this will do, will, it's going to usher in something really good, right? The kingdom. So verse 6, hold on, let me look at something. Okay. And he opened his mouth and blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is those who dwell in heaven. So the Antichrist, called the little horn in Daniel 7, was predicted to be a blasphemer of God. So I wrote in below there, Daniel 7, 8, compared to 7:25. These two scriptures say, while I was contemplating the horns, Daniel said, behold, another horn, a little one came up from among them. So how many horns? 
ten, but there's one little horn that comes up. See, this is the Antichrist who rules the ten-nation confederacy. And three of the horns were pulled up by the roots before it, and behold, this horn, that little horn, the Antichrist, possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. And what does it say? Revelation 13, 6. He utters great boasts. He's a blasphemer of God. Then in Daniel 7, 25, he will speak out against the Most High, against the Lord, and wear down the saints of the highest one, which is exactly what he'll do in the tribulation, going against believers. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. So there's that figure of the three and a half years, um, which we just saw down here in Revelation 12, 13, and 14. So all this is all coming to pass, right? We're seeing how Daniel prophesied it. In the future, it will happen. And the Antichrist will be given this authority for 42 months. So verse 6, I think our last verse for this morning says that the Antichrist specifically blasphemes against God, his name and his tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven. So God's tabernacle is his holy abode in the third heaven. And if you want, I get this question a lot, so I need to remember to do it. But people go, why do you keep saying the third heaven? Does anyone know where that is? 2 Corinthians 12, 2. Paul says, I know a man who went to the third heaven. I think it was him. I think Paul was killed, probably stoned to death in Lystra. He goes up to the throne room of God called the third heaven. So God's tabernacle is in this throne room, the third heaven. So Revelation eleven nineteen, 19, and the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. Revelation 15, 5, and these things, after these things I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. So the Antichrist blasphemes those who dwell in heaven, and who dwells in heaven? The Holy Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Father is Revelation 5, 7. Remember, He is the one on the throne. Jesus goes up to the one on the throne to take the scroll, so... The Father's on the throne. In five, uh, Revelation 5, 6, and 7, God the Son, the Lamb, second person of the Trinity, takes the scroll from the Father on the throne. And then Revelation 5, 6 mentions God the Holy Spirit, the sevenfold Spirit sent out into all the earth. So that's who's in heaven, but who else? Those who dwell in heaven refer to angels. Don't they dwell in heaven? Revelation five eleven. Paul, John says, I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and living creatures and the elders and a number of them was myriads of myriads. I interpret that as a bunch. I like that. Tons, as kids say, tons of them. And thousands of thousands. So God can number the angels and I'm sure he's named everyone and never forgets their name. But for us, it's like the sand of the seashore. We just can't number it. So it starts giving you some angelology. How many of them are there? Revelation seven eleven, and all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. And then who else dwells in heaven? Believers who are in the presence of God in the third heaven. You can turn to this one, Revelation 6. A lot of martyrs in heaven during the tribulation because they stand for Jesus and they get murdered for it. But again, if that happened... Even to us today for standing for Christ, they just sent us directly into the presence of the Lord in a split second. Revelation 6, 9, 
Then the lamb broke the fifth seal, and I saw under the altar the souls who had been slain because of the word of God. So why were they murdered? Because they stood for the Lord, the word of God, the Lord. Now, by the way, because of the word of God, is that Jesus the word? Revelation 19, he's called the word of God, Hologos Tutheu, or is this his scripture? Yes, thank you. If he is the word of God, then his word is truth. Well, is Jesus truth or the word? Y'all are good. He just is the truth. His word is truth, John 17, 17, and he is the word of God. And they're slain because of their representation of Christ and his word and because of the testimony which they had maintained. So they didn't give it up. And they cried. Now they're in heaven in the presence of God as martyrs saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Ah, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. So they go to him and say, When? Does it say? No, but Jesus has already taken the scroll from the Father on the throne, right? And that scroll, I believe, is a title deed to the earth from Jeremiah 32. Who owns the earth? Who owns the land? God. It's his. And when Jesus takes the scroll and starts to break its seals, he's saying, I'm I'm about ready to take the earth back. But it, it happens in a series of events in the tribulation culminating in that second advent when he comes back on the white horse. So verse 11, they were, there was given to each one of them a white robe and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer. Remember your parents used to say that? Just be patient. We're almost there. A little longer. Didn't that seem like an eternity? But he's like, it's coming. Until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were killed, even as they had been, so more martyrs to come in the tribulation would be completed also. So God allows the death of his servants to glorify his name, right? You're like, why didn't you just take us up and spare us all this? Weren't they obedient? Sure kills that partial rapture view that obedient believers go up. No, they die if they're obedient. And he's like, don't worry, more of you will be killed for your testimony. And that brings a testimony to this world. And then one day I'll resurrect you. And they're going to have the problem, not you. We really have to change our perspective on death, don't we? I think we're too afraid of it. But Jesus' life and rescues us from death, even though we have to go through it physically. We will be resurrected. Didn't he say, I am the resurrection and the death? No. I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. So we're all going to die. The question is, where are you going to go after you die? Are you going to be with Jesus Are you going to die and then face the second death, which is the lake of fire? Double death isn't good. But dying unto life through Jesus, as Paul says, to live is Christ, to die is gain. So verse 12, I'm sorry, Revelation 12, 12. For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, woe to the earth and the sea. So rejoice in the heavens, that's where the glory is, but woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has come down to you in the midpoint of the tribulation, having great wrath, knowing that he only has a short time. I mean, he's been so wrathful his whole career against God's people, but that last three and a half years, I always say, now the gloves are off, if you will. Will it matter? Go ahead, take the gloves off. It won't won't help you a bit. So, we see in chapter 13 as we close, the Antichrist. Anyone remember the Greek? I need that new body. I'm feeling it today. Antichristos. Anti means against or instead of. It can be a substitutionary preposition in place of. So we've been looking at Antichrist, but who was on that cross? Well, not anymore. Jesus Christ, Jesu Christo. So Christos in the Greek language means anointed one, Christ, Messiah. 
Mashiach in Hebrew, anointed one, Christos, equivalent, the Messiah. So we have Antichrist, a substitute Christ, and we have Jesus Christ. Who do you belong to today? Do you belong to the Antichrist, so to speak, the, de who, the devil who will rule him? Are you under his authority? Because when we believe in Christ, we're transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son. So if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you are under a death penalty, an eternal death penalty, and you're in a dominion of darkness. I don't care if you, you don't see it. Oh, everything's great. It's a beautiful day today. I'm doing fine. God says you're not doing fine. You're in a bad place. I don't care if you're wealthy, living in sunny California. You, you, you are in a bad spot. So how do you get out of that position of darkness? Well, God says I've been, I want everyone to do what this says on the board. Did I say bored? I am still back in elementary school <laughs> on the slide. So God provided a solution to bring us out of Satan's dark domain into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And here's what Jesus did, who is eternal God, second person of the Trinity, who becomes flesh. 1 Peter 2.24 says it well. He, Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his own body on the cross. So he hung on the cross six hours, but the last three and a half of those six hours, the hill was covered in darkness. God was not going to let anyone see what he was going to do to his son, but he would pour out all the sins of the world on his own son. By the way, raise your hand. Were your sins on that, nailed to that cross? Do you think they weren't? Oh, mine are so bad. No, all of them went to the cross. Uh, Colossians 3, they were nailed to the cross. And if you believe in Jesus, now what does he say to all of you? Forgiven. We don't, some of us just don't believe that. After, wait a minute, all those sins and all I have to do is believe in Jesus and I'm forgiven. Yes, because they were nailed to the cross. Do you see what God did? He took the sinless Son of God who is perfect righteousness, who knew no sin, but was made sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him, so he imputes the sins of the world to Jesus, and then when we believe in him, he credits perfect righteousness to our account. You won't find that in any religious system. You'll only find it in Holy Scripture. So if he died for all your sins and paid for that, and you're forgiven, how can you lose your salvation? I don't get that. If sins have been paid for, how can your sins as a believer who's been paid for send you to hell? Do you understand the... The conundrum with that statement? The unbeliever, his sins have gone to the cross, but he hasn't believed in Messiah, Jesus Christ. Therefore, the benefits of that payment have not been extended to him. As Gene Brown used to say, who went to be with the Lord years ago, God has made a peace treaty with man. Jesus has ratified it with his blood, and all he's asking you is to sign it. And to sign it means believe in him. And how many people did he just point, hold it out to, and there's no signature? Well, I didn't want that. I don't like Jesus. All that, I'm like, guy, if you have trouble with God and what he does, believe in his son and then work through that after salvation. We all have difficulties in our mind of why God allows evil in this world. And um, um, I've come to terms with it. He does. And I have a lot of answers for it. But for, to not believe in Jesus because of those bugaboos, okay, then you're going to face him as judge. And what will it matter then? You're going to argue with him then? Just believe in him and he'll give you answers to those questions. I might be able to give you some because the Bible reveals some of them. But doesn't the Bible say the hidden things belong to God and the revealed things to us? So how many things are hidden that we'll never know? And maybe even on the other side, he still won't tell us everything. So that's what he did, 1 Peter 2.24. So if he died for all the sins of the world, what does that make all mankind? Saved? Save a bull. If he had never gone to the cross, no man is savable. But since he did that, all men are now savable. So what do you do to receive the free gift? 
John 3.16, for God loved the world in this manner. I prefer that translation. What manner? That he gave his only son. That's a demonstration of love, right? If he gives his only son to die for us. That whoever are those who believe in him, is that works or faith? Belief. Should not perish but have eternal life. For he, verse 18, for he who believes in him is not condemned. That's how you get out of that death penalty because if you've believed in Christ as your Savior, you're no longer under the death penalty. But he who does not believe stands condemned already because he hasn't believed in the name of the only Son of God. And then John 5, 24, he who believes in Jesus or the one who sent Jesus has what? Eternal life. And then it says he has passed from death, darkness, into life. How many seconds did that take to go from death in Adam to a life that God in Christ Jesus? One split second. And once you're in that position, you remain. And then it says, another part of that verse is great, and he does not come under judgment. So what will God never do with you as a believer? He'll never judge you eternally for your sins because he poured out his wrath on his own son, Jesus Christ. And the Antichrist, when he rules, as Satan has been doing since the fall of man, is trying to defer you away from the only way of salvation. And he's doing a great job with that. How many people won't go to Jesus? But there's only one Savior, right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And Acts 4.12, there's no name given among men under heaven by which we must be saved. So the choice is yours. Stay under the wrath of God and face him as judge for eternity or believe in him as savior today and you can walk away today with eternal life and you'll have no more questions beyond that point. (laughs) And now the questions begin. And now maybe the wrestling of the problems you've been having and And the answers can come. Because I tell people, look, if you're wrestling with all these questions about God, you don't even have the Holy Spirit. Why not believe in Jesus, get the Holy Spirit, and now maybe God can reveal these issues. There are solutions to these problems through the Scripture to you. But have you ever met somebody that will not go to Jesus because of... And some of the things they say, I'm like, I wouldn't have gone to him either. What Jesus are you talking about? You're talking about some religious man that some religion made up. He's not that way. Well, yeah, they told me I had to sell my car to go to heaven because it was too nice or something. Who told you that? Did Jesus show me where he said that? And then they get into other areas. I don't understand why Jesus or the Lord would tell the Jews to go in and wipe out people in Deuteronomy 20. And um, those are hard questions. Why do we suffer? I don't get that. Why isn't he taking care of me? And um, there are answers to those questions. And but we need the Holy Spirit, I think, to understand them. So try to drive through that and impress the importance of the gospel. Because if they don't believe in Jesus, nothing else really matters, right? It, as we, and I hate the phrase, but I use it at the end of the day. Okay, I'm going to stop here. And we will pick up in Revelation 13 again. We've got a lot to cover in this chapter. And I'm going to start going into some of the globalism that we're seeing in our culture. I'm going to do some addendums to this because we're definitely seeing the stage setting up quickly uh, and a lot of stage setting going on with what's happening in our, uh, our world climate. Um, something I've never seen in history, as you read history, um, the way things are going, Oh, who was coming through that door? I heard a door creaking. (laughs) Friend or foe? It's friend. (laughs) You got to be careful on this day, right? You got to watch your doors. Well, let's um, close in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for minding us. As the scripture says, we can cast all our anxieties on you because you care for us. And Lord, we have a lot of cares in this world, but may we stick to the scripture, all of it. It's so important. We were in First and Second Samuel in the, and have been for so long in the first hour, and that has everything to do with what we're studying. 
And now we're going to the extreme, going to the end of history when the worst period of history will unfold. But that wonderful kingdom of Christ will come, which has been anticipated since the Torah. You revealed a kingdom to come, and we've been, believers throughout history have been waiting for it, and it will come. And we will enjoy for eternity. Momentary light affliction, as the scripture says, will be turned into an eternal weight of glory. So, Lord, we anticipate with great eagerness the return of our Savior, who will descend from heaven with a a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And we thank you for those comforting words. So we'll praise you in those words today in Jesus' name. Amen.